The house in which I grew up in Staten Island, New York, had several levels, one being a finished basement where my grandmother lived. So when I was a child, I traveled between two worlds upstairs, my living quarters, of course, with my very evangelical parents who had been baptized into the Protestant church just one year after I was born. And downstairs, Grandma lived with her deep, abiding Catholic faith. Whenever I would go downstairs to visit Grandma or that occasional time that I slept over, I used to look at all of the things on her dresser, little pictures of funny-looking people in red cloaks and big hats, women and men alike, her rosaries and other objects. I think there was a picture of the Pope and, of course, Jesus and the Holy Mother. And I'd say, Grandma, who are these? And she'd say, oh, those are the saints, saints like St. Andrew and St. Joseph. And she would tell stories about those saints. I would go upstairs into the normal part of the house where I lived, and I'd say to my mom and dad, where are the saints? And my mom, my, my dad would say, there ain't no saints up here. <laughs> With this very Protestant uh, ethic of, uh, of not having saints. That's right, that's fine. <laughs> so in my house growing up, I had the Pope downstairs, and we had a Bible upstairs, and I grew up in between those worlds, and eventually, as I read the Bible for myself and I studied God's Word, I rediscovered that there were saints in the Bible indeed. But the Bible tells us that not only are saints those of us who have gone before us, upon whose shoulders that we stand and those heroes that we look up to, but the saints are indeed all God's children. Because literally the word saint in Greek means holy one. And we are called to be holy as God is holy, and therefore all of us call to be saints. I thought about my grandmother uh, throughout my time growing up, and I thought that, you know, she wasn't the kind of person you would think of as a saint. She had a long-running feud with her neighbor, and they used to exchange words, probably not very good, in Italian. She used to allow me to stay up late when I slept over her house so we can watch the likes of Archie Bunker and George Jefferson and Johnny Carson. And she had very choice words to say the many game show contestants that came on her favorite game shows during the day, and she used to yell at the game show contestants if they didn't get something right or what happened. She read dime store novels and did all kinds of funny things that you wouldn't think a saint would do. But then as I thought about it, and I thought of the many saints that made up those pictures on her dresser, I simply thought about the things that she, rep she did for me how she represented her life to me. You know, no matter what I did, she always loved me unconditionally. She would always encourage me and hug me. It didn't matter if I was sad or I was being bad or made an unwise decision. She had this unconditional love for me. We were, my sisters and I, and I were the apple of her eye. If I threw a tantrum, she gave me a stick of gum. If I had a bad day and I was grouchy, she made me meatballs. And she always had a kind word to say. When Haley was born, uh, we would put pictures up of Grandma there above her bed so that she can see her Grandma, who uh, at that time lived in New York and we lived in Georgia. And we would remind Haley that her middle name, Haley's middle name, Santina, was my grandmother's first name, which literally translates in Italian as Little Saint. And my daughter grew up with that saint above her bed noting that Grandma Santina was a person who loved her very much and who represented for all of us that kind of grace that God has for us. Now you may be thinking, I ain't no saint. No saints around here. But when we look at Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians who were close to Paul's heart, we can see a very basic foundation for what it means to be a saint. You see, Paul commended them and encourage them because the churches at Thessalonica imitated not only Paul and their teachers and their pastors, but also imitated Christ. This was the primary way that people did discipleship back then in education. If you were an apprentice in a trade or if you were a student uh, with a teacher, your goal was to mimic or imitate the master or your teacher. 
In fact, if you wanted to be a writer or a poet back in Jesus' day, there was no teacher encouraging you to strike it out on your own. Rather, the teachers would have you sit down and copy over and over again poems like the Iliad or the Odyssey or the Aeneid. Imitation was the main way of becoming a disciple in that day and age. So Paul knew that as disciples, we are called to follow in the footsteps of Christ. That we are to make Christ's teaching and Christ's commandments our own. And here he praises those churches for imitating them. But then he notes in the next verse that not only do they imitate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but they also became an example for others to follow. In fact, he says that you're such a good example, your faith is known throughout that area. And lo and behold, he reminded them that not only are they to imitate their teachers and Jesus, but they are to set an example for those who are trying to imitate them. For we know that there are many saints in our life that we want to imitate. I'm sure that there are people in your life who have taught you the Bible stories and taught you the ways of God, who have been an encouragement for you, who have been that symbol of grace in your life. It could be family, perhaps a grandparent or a parent, or maybe even a deacon or a favorite pastor or a Sunday school teacher at church, who you want it to be when you grow up. You may, want, you may have said, I want to pray like that person when I grow up, or I want to know the Bible like that person when I grow up. And now, as you are a Christian and you are walking with Christ, you may note that there are people who may be looking up to you, even if you don't know it. People may be looking to how you speak or how you act, noting that you're a Christian, and may find encouragement from your life who may experience Christ's love through the things that you do, even if you don't know it. It was Matthew McConaughey who once gave a speech at the Academy Awards after he won an award for one of his movies, who said that it's, a, it's always a good idea to have someone to look up to, something to look forward to, and a hero to chase. But I think that if you miss the meaning of All Saints Sunday, and you miss the biblical implications of what it means to be a holy one called out in order to be holy to a God who is holy, then you may just forget that you might be a hero that someone is trying to chase. That we need to live a life that others can imitate. And we can be an example with our words that we speak, in our speech and in our life, in how we worship, and how we make decisions in our worldview, you know, you have a prime example to be an example this Tuesday. When the world is anxious and uncertain and people are running around like chickens without their heads going crazy about who might be elected Tuesday, you have an opportunity to be an example. For the joy that you have in the Lord on Wednesday morning should be the same joy that you have in the Lord on Tuesday morning as well as Monday morning. I want to encourage you that when you wake up Wednesday, no matter who's elected, you say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And when you go to work or you go to the grocery store on Wednesday and everyone's up in an uproar, you can set an example, for you are holy as God is holy, and you know that Christ is King. Now you may still say to me, Joe, ain't no saint. There are no saints around here. But it might help you to think about the many ways that you have encouraged and touched the lives of others in a way that you may not even have known. Over this past week, I ran across a letter that was written, it was an open letter written to the op-ed section of the New York Times by a writer who, whose wife died of an asthma attack, went into a coma, and for seven days died in Cambridge Hospital. He was so touched by the staff there, he felt compelled to write a letter to the New York Times con encouraging and just praising the staff for how they treated him and his wife. And I'd like to read you that letter because I think it's one that really gets us to think about All Saints Day. Listen to this letter by Peter DeMarco, who wrote after the death of his young wife. As I begin to tell my friends and family about the seven days you treated my wife, Laura, in what turned out to be the last days of her young life, they stopped me at about the 15th name that I recall. 
The list includes the doctors, nurses, respiratory specialists, social workers, even cleaning staff members who care for her. How do you remember any of their names, they ask. How could I not? Every single one of you treated Laura with such professionalism, kindness, and dignity as she lay unconscious. When she needed shots, you apologized that it was going to hurt a little, whether or not she could hear. When you listened to her heart and lungs through your stethoscopes, and her gown began to slip, you pulled it up to respectfully cover her. You spread a blanket, not only when her body temperature needed regulating, but also when the room was just a little cold, and you thought she'd sleep more comfortably that way. You cared so greatly for her parents, helping them climb into the room's awkward recliner, fetching some fresh water almost by the hour, and by answering every one of their medical questions with incredible patience. My father-in-law, a doctor himself, you learned, felt he was involved in her care, and I can't tell you how important that was to him. Then there was how you treated me. How would I have found the strength to have made it through that week without you? How many times did you walk into that room to find me sobbing, my head down, resting on her hand, quietly going about your task as if invisible? How many times did you help me set up the recliner so close as possible to her bedside, crawling into the mess of wires and tubes around her bed in order to swing her forward just a few feet? How many times did you check in on me to see whether I needed anything from food to drink, fresh clothes to a hot shower, or to see whether I needed a better explanation of a medical procedure or just someone to talk to? How many times did you hug me and console me when I fell to pieces or ask about Laura's life and the person she was, taking time to look at her photos or read the things I'd written about her? How many times did you deliver bad news with compassionate words and sadness in your eyes? And there is a moment, actually a single hour, that I will never forget. On the final day, as we waited for Laura's organ donor surgery, all I wanted was to be alone with her. But family and friends kept coming to say their goodbyes, and the clock ticked away. And about 4 p.m., finally, everyone had gone, and I was emotionally and physically exhausted, so I needed a nap. I asked her nurses if they could help me set up the recliner, which was so com uncomfortable, but all I had, and next to Laura again, and they had a better idea. They asked me to leave the room, and, room for a moment, and when I returned, they had shifted Laura to the right side of her bed, leaving just enough room for me to crawl in with her one last time. I asked if they can give us one hour without single interruption, and they nodded, closing the curtains and the doors and shutting off the lights. I nestled my body against hers, she looked so beautiful, and I told her so, stroking her hair and her face. I laid my head in her chest, feeling it rise and fall with each breath, her heart beat in my ear. It was our last tender moment as husband and wife, and it was more natural and pure and comforting than anything I've ever felt, and then I fell asleep. I will remember that last hour together for the rest of my life, it was a gift beyond gifts, and I have to thank you for it. With eternal gratitude and love, Peter DeMarco. In that letter, you will not find any miracles. You will not find people walking on water, or preaching long sermons, or giving lengthy speeches. You will not find people giving advice or trying to save the world. You only find people doing what they do every day, smiling and hugging and helping, giving encouraging words and just doing what they do best and what they know how to do. That's what it means to be a saint. If you want to find a saint, you don't need to find pictures and postcards on my grandma's dresser. Just look around. Amen.